Hello. You haven't found a seat yet? Go ahead and grab you one. We're going to get started here. All right. It's great to see so many people here this evening. This is awesome. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I am not Steve Slifer, as you all have uh, probably noticed by now. Um, Steve, as most of you know, is our normal organizer and MC for our quarterly speaker series. Um, however, he is on the uh, the back end of about with COVID and resting comfortably at home. So hopefully um, he'll be back to 100% here real soon. So who the world am I? Um, well, my name is Derek Epperson, and I am honored to be this year's president of the Rotary Club of Daniel Island, one of your sponsors here this evening. And I'd like to welcome you all to the January edition of the Daniel Island Community Speaker Series. Um, in addition to the Rotary Club, the Speaker Series is also sponsored by the Daniel Island Business Association, uh, the Daniel Island Community Association, and then of course our host here this evening, the Daniel Island Club. Um, we're pleased to have been able to join forces with um, each of those groups um, to be able to present the Speaker Series to you all for more than a decade now, for those of you that were, were here in November, that was our, our 10 year anniversary for the speaker series. So this evening, we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Deborah Bronk, who is the president and CEO of Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences up in the great state of Maine. Um, we're, uh, yeah, yay, Maine. We're, uh, we're obviously all concerned about the health of the oceans and rising sea levels and what that might mean for the world in general. Um, but also to life right here in Charleston. So in a few minutes, we'll be honored to get to hear the views of a world-renowned ocean scientist. Um, but first, we don't typically uh, recognize individuals in the audience, but in this case, we've got some individuals here this evening who in one way or another are certainly con concerned about, about water. Um, first and foremost is uh, Charleston Mayor John Tecklenburg. So we would be remiss if we didn't recognize the mayor who, along with our city council, has been grappling with the solutions to uh, many types of flooding that, that's overwhelming various parts of our city. Uh, mayor Tecklenburg is, of course, a, a past speaker for this speaker series. Uh, and since he wasn't able to join us back in November when we honored a number of our past speakers at our 10-year anniversary, uh, we would like to take the opportunity to thank him now for being one of our past distinguished speakers. So thank you for being here, Mayor. And I believe the mayor brought with him Mr. Dale Morris. Is Dale here? Did he make it? Hey, Dale. Um, <clears throat> Dale is our uh, uh, chief resilience officer for the city, so we welcome you here this evening. Um, also with us this evening is City Council Representative Mike Seekings. Um, Mike's district is, is downtown, which is obviously ground zero for um, the various types of flooding here in the city. So thank you, Mike, for being here. Um, in addition to these city officials, we're thrilled to have with us uh, this evening, Mr. Sam Norton. I think I saw Sam sitting back here and about halfway down the rooms. So uh, Sam is actually president of Heron Farms, and um, he's certainly interested in farming, but not on land, but rather in the sea. Um, so obviously, in order for that to happen, uh, he needs to have healthy ocean water. Um, also with us tonight is Jared Bramblett. There's Jared. Uh, Jared is with um, HDR Design Firm. Um, Jared's both a hydrologist and a uh, photographer and uh, has highlighted ways that we could all deal with our water problem by implementing solutions uh, that have been used elsewhere and also make our city a, a better place at the same time. Uh, both Sam and Jared um, are also past TED Talk speakers, so definitely check out their their talks. I'm sure they're on YouTube somewhere. Uh, so Sam and Jared, uh, welcome to the both of you. Uh, and finally with us this evening is Gideon Snyderman. Please stand up for a second. Gideon's way back here in the back. Gideon is 12 years old, 
and is a seventh grader at Porter Gaub. And um, he actually asked if he could attend Dr. Bronk's presentation this evening. And from what I understand, also received a promise from his teacher to receive a little extra credit in here. But the bottom line is, I'm not sure how many 12-year-olds out there would to come to a presentation like this. So, uh, Gideo, bravo to you, and thank you for being our guest tonight. So I guess the point in, in me recognizing all these individuals is that um, um, we're all interested in, in um, our oceans and our water, um, not just the folks that I mentioned, uh, but all of us in this room, and, um, and that's obviously why we're here. Okay, let's quickly look ahead. Um, please mark your calendars as our next speaker series will be Wednesday evening, April 26. Um, it's funny, you know, sometimes we have to look a little harder to find our quarterly speakers. Um, but sometimes they're literally right underneath our noses. And that is certainly the case this time. Our speaker in April will be the aforementioned City Council Representative Mike Seekings. Yes. So Mike spoke to our Rotary Club um, back in April of last year, and he was such a big hit amongst our members that we wanted to bring him back to speak to all of you. Mike is the representative for District 8, which basically encompasses all the downtown peninsula from the Battery to Calhoun west of King Street. He was first elected to city council back in November of 2013, and he's widely recognized as one of the hardest working members on the council. And as a result, the Charleston City Paper has voted him the best city council member straight years. That's like batting a thousand, right, Mike? Not too shabby. So, Mike, thank you for joining us on April 26th. We certainly look forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay, now on to the main event. Um, Dr. Bronk is actually our first out-of-town quarterly speaker. So congratulations for being our first out -er. Um, So why her? Well, the answer is that Daniel Island resident Randy Jeffrey uh, and his wife Kim spend their summers up in Booth Bay Harbor in Maine, which happens to be the same village Dr. Bronk's Big Ol' Labs is located. Um, he had the opportunity to visit the lab, Dr. Bronk, and was so impressed by her and the research that the Institute was doing that he wanted us all on Daniel Island to be as impressed by her and the Bigelow Institute as he has been. Randy previously had a 40 year career in the radio industry and now is a trustee at Bigelow Labs. So Randy, why don't you come on up here and introduce the rest of us to Dr. Brown. I, I know what you're thinking. He's got a face for radio. Yeah. Belongs on the radio, doesn't it? Uh, all I can say is, wow, I'm looking out here at a sea of people on a not very pleasant night. And I can tell you that uh, you're not the only one that battled the elements to get here. Our, our featured speaker tonight uh, had her challenges coming down from Portland, Maine this morning. And I think we arrived at my home around 4.40 uh, this afternoon. <laughs> uh, for nearly 50 years, Bigelow Lab scientists have been probing the oceans around our globe, the entire Earth. They've been discovering the secrets, the problems, the opportunities, and they've also along the way been creating the solutions. As a result, the lab's work is widely recognized and acclaimed by the national and international scientific and academic communities. However, our work is lesser known to the general public. Thus, tonight's presentation and presentations that will be taking place in the Low Country over the next two days, just like this, featuring the president and the CEO of Bigelow Labs, Dr. Deborah Brock, who is regarded as one of the foremost ocean scientists in the world. In front of each of you is information about Bigelow Labs. Uh, it's a chance to learn more about the laboratory, uh, become involved, uh, get on the mailing list. Uh, and I say involved uh, either uh, as a volunteer with your time or with resources. Each of you have one of these cards in front of you. 
And if you'd be so kind, if you'd like to get on the mailing list, fill it out, leave it in the center of your table, we'll pick it up and we'll take it from there. To that extent, I'd like to introduce a member of the Bigelow team who is here tonight to answer any questions you might have following Dr. Bronk's presentation. He's a, a very bright light on the brilliant Bigelow team, makes his home in the same place that L.L. Bean makes their home in Freeport, Maine. Please welcome Michael Villarreal. Now, before Debbie comes up, we'd like to show you a brief video about the lab. It's a chance to get to know more about us. It's also an opportunity to meet a few of our very dedicated and extremely determined scientists. A warm Daniel Allen welcome for Debbie Brock. Wow, well, thank you. Um, thank you very much for everybody coming. I was just thinking, I've been giving climate change talks for probably 15 years now. And I used to be in grimy little rooms with hecklers in the back with like nine grumpy people that my mom paid to be there. So <laughs> this is, I am just thrilled that people cared enough to come out uh, tonight. So thank you. Okay, so um, one of the things when I hear, can you hear me okay? Am I standing too close to this? Okay. One of the things uh, when I hear a talk is I'm like, you don't know me from a hole in the wall, so why should you listen to anything I have to say? So I'm going to give you just a, a, a quick brief tour of my career. So I am, and I want to say this all the time now that I'm a CEO because I am, I am a scientist. I'm not just an administrator. I, sometimes people laugh at that, but you don't have to if you don't want to. But um, I spent 30 years studying nitrogen in the ocean. It is, we all need nitrogen. All living organisms need nitrogen. We get it from the food we eat. If you're a microbe in the ocean, you get it from the fluid that's that's all around you. Uh, and it is a major determinant of how fast phytoplankton can grow and so how productive they are. So each one of these stars is where I did, did an expedition. Um, and some of these shots are for the last decade, I ended up doing a lot of my work in the polar regions because that is where so much of the change is, is happening on such a, an elevated scale. One of the things I did while I was a, a college professor at the College of William and Mary is I took a leave of absence and I went and I served at the National Science Foundation, which I always want to sing its praises when I give a talk. Um, NSF is the uh, federal agency. It's a small, relatively small agency in the federal government, and it is something that all of us um, should be very proud of. It is, uh, I would, the one reason why I think the United States has spent much of the last 70 years as a leader in science and technology in so many fields is because we as a country invest in the foundational knowledge we need to advance technology, NASA, NIH, we, we, we study things for knowledge sake and that really empowers everything. So when I was at NSF, I was, I ended up being director for ocean studies for the ocean science program. I ran, I had a budget of $356 million, which I remember I was like, that's like more money than God has. When you think about it though, for a country this size, that's about a dollar a person. That's what we are investing in the foundational understanding of the ocean. It's not enough, it's not even close to being enough. And that became very clear when I started looking at all the things I was supposed to be doing and covering with the resources. Ocean drilling, ocean observing, the, the, the core research programs, ocean technology, ocean education. So I got very interested in what does the next generation of Marine Lab look like, right? It, we can't keep doing what we're doing the way we're doing it, we can't afford to do it. Other countries are, are, have caught up or surpassed us. China in particular is investing billions of dollars into ocean science. So what, is, what do the United States do? In a situation like that, we've got to innovate our way out of that because we're not going to outspend some of these other countries. And so I got really interested in led some brainstorming sessions, often with a lot of wine involved. 
And um, and then I ended up finishing my my tour of duty and I went back to my research and I got invited to a big old laboratory to give a talk about my Arctic research. And I remember my, I spent about a week there and I was just blown away by it because Bigelow was one of the few marine labs that in some of the other service things I had done, I had not made it all the way up to Maine. And it looked very much like the kind of brainstorming activities that we had been doing in terms of how to get cheaper, faster, more nimble about how we did research. And so I made the decision when, five years ago now to give up my own research program and to move to Maine. And I want to go through just a few of the characteristics because there's people of influence in this room. And I think when we think about how science should evolve um, in this country, I think Bigelow has some real lessons there. One, we are a multidisciplinary group of people. You hear about the silos in science. So what we really need is we need scientists of many different disciplines coming together to look at a question. And that's what we do at the lab, right? So we've got chemists next to physicists, next to people that study disease. And we're all focused though on marine issues around microbes. We have no departments, um, so no departmental boundaries. Everybody's just all piled together in one place. And it's we're thinking about growing and how do we grow and still keep that lack of boundaries? So that the which is again what science has to really focus on and the, the, these team efforts are really important in trying to um, attack questions, especially as complex as climate change. We have relatively no bureaucracy, for better or worse, it, it stops with me. Um, nobody told me that there was gonna be a global pandemic when I took this job and yet we, could re we never closed, we could be very nimble, we kept the science moving forward and we uh, uh, kept everybody safe. We have shared discovery centers. One of the characteristics of the United States and our science enterprise is we pride ourselves on, on the, the instrumentation we provide our scientists. When I was a college professor, I had you know, half a dozen million dollar instruments in my lab and those same instruments were repeated in other places across the campus. That's very expensive. That's a very expensive way to do science. So at Bigelow, we have we just have one of those things and everybody uses it. And we have these centers where the we have professionals that are experts on the various analyses and the scientists can think about the questions and use all of these facilities to get the data they need to solve it. It's a very efficient way of doing things. We are largely self-supported. So we provide the scientists that are there 11 weeks of salary a year. Everything else is contracts and grants. And compared to a university, that's pretty lean. On the other hand, it's it's how the rest of the world works. If you're a businessman, you're not guaranteed a salary. We also have no tenure. Um, I could give a whole other talk on the pros and cons of tenure, which I won't do. But what it means is they got to bring it every day. And they do. It's a very vibrant uh, uh, environment to do science. So why would scientists want to come to a situation like that? Because when we go after a scientist, we get them. They want to come. And it's because they have the freedom to do the research that they want to do without all the other burdens. So as a college professor on a, on a, on a good year, I probably spent 30 or 40% of my time on research. And that's something that all of us should be concerned about in the United States, because so much of the research used to be done by univer in universities, and it still is but we are putting more and more activities on our college professors and it's reducing the amount of time they can spend on research. At Bigelow, it, they're spending 80, 90% of their time. And it really shows in terms of competitiveness with grants and just the sheer amount of productivity and advances they can churn out. So that's my little Bigelow spiel. So now let's, let's get into the climate change kind of things. And I'm gonna talk about three different questions. One, where do, these, where do things stand today? So what I'm gonna cover is kind of the basics on what I would hope everybody in the United States would understand about our changing climate focused on the ocean. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what Bigelow is doing about these things as an example of, of the kinds of things science can address, and in some cases, the things that science won't be able to address. And then I wanna end with, uh, what can you do about it? So one of the things I did a few years ago, I had the, the, the privilege to testify before Congress on two occasions. This was the first occasion. 
Um, and the two gentlemen to my right in this picture um, gave their testimony after me, and they were both climate deniers. And this is one of my all time favorite pictures. Oh, oh, I just touched the button. He told me never to touch. Oh, there it is. Okay. So as, as unhappy as I am with what he's saying, the woman behind him is in physical pain. I put this up because it is one of the biggest challenges with climate, um, climate change is who do you trust? When you hear people talk, who do you trust to tell you the truth or what is the best known fact? So one advice I always try to give people is there are a number of excellent consensus documents in the science community around climate, climate change. Anything put out by the IPCC, these are consensus documents. This is, um, this is uh, uh, the, um, the fifth assessment. This included uh, work from over experts from over 80 countries. It took six years to pull these, this together. Over 830 lead authors um, and review editors drew on the work of over 1,000 different contributors. Over 2,000 expert reviewers provided, uh, provided over 140 review comments. Every one of those has to be addressed. I mean, I don't know how you make a process more rigorous than this. And what is all amazing about this is if you think about what a scientist is, scientists argue for a living. It's why we're not great dates all the time, right? We are trained. We want to pick each other, uh, their, the, 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 the ideas and the thoughts apart. That's how we get stronger in terms of and more robust in terms of the theories and the hypotheses we're testing. So for a group of scientists, and in this case, it is really a global community of scientists in many, many different disciplines to come together, first to take the time to come together, and then to say, yes, there are some things we can agree on is really a powerful, incredibly powerful statement. And then the U.S. has a number of these documents. One is the, this is the um, Fourth National Climate Assessment. Um, and then anything from the National Academies. So the way the National Academy reports work is somebody funds a report. They want to know something about something. So when I was at the National Science Foundation, I wanted a decadal survey of ocean science. So we funded that. Once you ask them the questions you want answered, you have no control over the process. It is incredibly rigorous. The National Academy process is basically what the IPCC um, started working from. So Congress listens to these reports. And if you go and look at them, they're all available free online and many, many different topics. You are getting as, as, as broadly agreed on as the science can handle at the time. They're very, very useful documents. So I would encourage you to look at them. Okay, so what I'm gonna tell you are these kind of consensus, what everybody can agree on. And, in, and st we're gonna start with the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect is the reason why we're dealing with, with the, the changing climate we have right now. So Earth has an atmosphere around it made up of a variety of gases. Humans did not cause the greenhouse effect. It, we were a cold, dead rock without the greenhouse effect. It is um, It refers to as solar radiation comes in through the atmosphere. It, it is reflected off of various surfaces. Some of that energy is absorbed and what comes back out and is reflected back out is not quite as powerful. So it can't, some of it can't make it out through the atmosphere and it is stays in the atmosphere, warming up the planet. Very similar to the glass of a greenhouse. Now the problem we're running into is that this was the 2021, in 2021, three, 36 billion tons of carbon is what Humanity took from the ground, coal, oil, petroleum, and we burned it to power this incredible society that we have. That's a wonderful thing. We would not be sitting in this beautiful room if we hadn't been doing that. The unintended consequence, though, is these gases are accumulating in our atmosphere, and it's warming the whole place up. So this is looking at the, the global temperature anomaly, and this is really where everything kind of starts. We've got these gases increase in the atmosphere, it's thickening that atmospheric blanket, it's warming up. 
If you look at the temp, and this is the um, anomaly in temperature. So oh, it's a middle one. So if you take the average temperature from um, the 40s to the 80s, and you look before that, it was cooler. And since that time, it is getting warmer. And it's getting warmer at a faster rate. Now, every so often I see, I read climate change literature all the time, and every so often I see something that just stops me cold. And this is one of those graphs that does that. Now, the imp, what is the impact of that increasing temperature anomaly on the, on the planet? I'm a huge fan of The Economist. I think it's a, I think it's a great, I think it's a really great, sometimes depressing. It's, there's no pictures and there's so much text and it comes every single week. But it's but it's a but it's a I think it's a fabulous publication, and this um, this particular figure came out in 2021, and what it is showing is it's showing um, the areas of the globe that are exceeding where um, human beings have lived in the past. So when you if you read anything about um, other animals, they will have a range where they can exist. And this, in a, in a sense, is looking at the range of where human beings have been able to exist. The blue areas is where there's no change, which as the changes are happening, we anticipate that these will still be very fine places for, for humanity to exist. And the redder you get, the more outside it is from where human beings have ever existed in terms of the conditions. And this is not only temperature, it's, it's also um, humidity, or um, or lack of moisture. And what is scary about this figure is the geopolitical implications of something like this. So vast regions, oh, and this is in 2070. So think about what 2070 is. It seems very far in the, in the future, but if you have a 10 year old daughter, granddaughter, grandson, they will be 58 in 2070. I'm 59. so. This is what they will be experiencing during their lifetime as I've experienced the last years. This is not some distant, you know, um, a, a far distant that nobody we know today is gonna experience. This is gonna be the prime of their life is what's gonna be experiencing this. And when you think about what happened um, over the past five years alone in terms of the refugee crisis in Europe and the, the decrease in democracy, the increase in authoritarianism, simply trying to deal with a million refugees. What happens when that million is a billion? You think we have a problem at our southern border now. What happens when the, the northern half of South America has vast regions that aren't habitable by human beings for lengths of time out of, air, out of an air-conditioned room? The, the, we can think that if we live inland, maybe we're not gonna be impacted by climate change. There's all kinds of games I think we play in our mind. And yet when you look at something like this, this is a profound effect on our future and especially on our kids' future. Okay, so one comment I get a lot is, but the climate has always changed and that is absolutely true. Earth has continued to evolve and CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere has, have changed dramatically over the, over the history of the Earth. But this is looking at global CO2 atmospheric concentrations. Here we're at 280, which is where we think it was around at the start of the Industrial Revolution. And then these are measurements. By the time you get out to about this point, these are direct measurements. So these aren't modeled. And this is going out to, I think, 2020 is where it ends here. So yes, CO2 has changed. What is, what is so troubling is it's the rate of change. So think about if you are backing out of your garage and your wife walks behind your car and you didn't see her, you might bump her, she'll hit the car and it'll stop, right? The speed was low and I don't know if this is a good example. The speed is low enough, speed is low enough that maybe a bruise or an annoyance. Okay, now hit that person going 50 miles an hour. It's a whole different ball of wax, right? So it is the speed that this is happening. Um, and it is unprecedented. These concentrations are unprecedented um, with very robust certainty over the last 800,000 years. So yes, it has always changed, but what we are looking at is a change of really enormous consequence compared to the geologic record that we, um, for the last 800,000 years.
Okay, so we've been talking about I've been talking about CO2, but CO2 is not the only contributor to the this atmospheric blanket. Um, on here is a graph uh, uh, pie chart. About seventy percent of the human caused emissions are CO2. The next most important one is methane, which is getting a lot of attention. Um, nitrous oxide, lapping gas is, is the next, and then fluorinated gases, some of which we got, we already got rid of many of them, but we still use fluorinated gases in a number of industrial applications. And it's these that, you know, carbon dioxide is the big, the big player, and yet these, they might not be in as high a concentration, but they are very powerful. So this is looking at the warming potential of these different gases compared to CO2. So taking CO2 as kind of the baseline, methane has about 25 times the warming potential. Nitrous oxide is about 300 times the warming potential. And some of these fluorinated gases can be up to 10,000 times the warming potential. So when we think about trying to control CO2, that's a great thing. But the more we control CO2, we've also gotta be thinking about some of these other gases. Now, where is all this warming going? And it goes primarily in the ocean, right? So the ocean is absorbing all of this excess energy that's that's being retained by the planet, by the atmosphere. And so now I want to go, and I'm going to go through the five things that in my testimony to Congress, in my undergraduate um, uh, intro to to marine science course. These are the things I would hope that everybody that cares anything about climate change in the ocean would, would know. The first is that ocean warming leads to the melting of sea ice, right? And it, it's kind of like a runaway train. A lot more energy bounces off something white, right? That albedo, than something dark. And you know that if you go from um, a concrete slab to an asphalt parking lot. That asphalt parking lot is darker. It absorbs so much energy. So we are now looking at an ice-free Arctic within the next couple of decades, if it even takes that long. Now, for people in the United States, this is really affecting um, our uh, fellow countrymen in Alaska. So I've done a lot of work in Alaska. And it's a pretty devastating situation up there because normally the coast would be permafrost, right? Which is just basically frozen land, which is like a rock. And that frozen land has um, ice all around it, sea ice all around it. So when the big storms come in, it's protected by the ice and it's a rock anyway. So it's it's very unlikely to be get much damage. Well, now the ice is gone and that permafrost is just kind of a sponge. And we are just eroding vast regions. In, in the time between visits three to six months apart, we would see erosion of the beach, probably from here out to the front of the building. And there's really nowhere for these people to go because if you go inland, it's just the permafrost melting and it's ponds and karst and you can't build on it. So it's really a catastrophic problem. Um, and this is 30, these are the 31 villages that we know of now that are going to have to be relocated because they just won't be habitable anymore. The one, um, never mind, I'm going to try to make a bad Putin joke, but it's really bad about in Siberia with this. So, but Putin doesn't live there. So, um, I should have just aborted that before it ever came out. Um, ocean warming also leads to reductions in ocean oxygen. So the big the big example of this is the dead zone um, in the Gulf of Mexico. And if you look all around the coast, these are these hypoxic areas, which are low oxygen areas. So these red dots, they're all along the coast because that's where all the nutrients, where the nitrogen comes off the land and fuels the microbes that go kind of crazy. Then there are a whole slew of other processes in the ocean that I don't have time to go into that also cause vast regions of the ocean to lose oxygen. And a lot of it is just simply the fact that the surface ocean is so warm and it's overlaying the cold deep water and it just doesn't mix as well very much. Now I tried to think of an example of that in, um, in Charleston. So I've been Googling around and trying to learn more about Charleston. It looks like you had hypoxic problems in the, um, the harbor in Charleston back in the 90s that was addressed some way. So I did not see a lot of um, issues with hypoxia. But if you ever see any of these fountains in, um, in the ponds or inland, they're trying to address hypoxia, right? You're trying to um, 
aerate so that you don't get all of the nasty uh, microbial process that can happen if low oxygen happen happens in these bodies of water. The third thing is that ocean warming leads to changes in the migration and distribution of organisms. Now in Maine, the big thing is the lobster, right? The lobster industry in the Gulf of Maine is the most lucrative fishery in the United States. Um, and it is on the move. There used to be a vibrant fishery off Long Island, that's gone. Then on Cape Cod, that's gone. And now in the Gulf of Maine, they're moving into cooler, deeper water and they're moving into Canada. So that's, a, that's something that we deal with in Maine every day. Some examples that you yourself might have come up with here is that it's also changing the, the community of the microscopic um, phytoplankton that are all around us in the coastal ocean and also in the freshwater ponds and inlets around. Um, two species that you guys are dealing with is one is um, lingbia and the other one is microcystin. Microcystin is in freshwater. Uh, it causes these nasty kind of funky green um, coatings on water. And I'm a dog lover. I, I, I have dogs. They're like my children. And one of the first uh, signs of a problem with a microcystin bloom is um, dogs get sick or die. So it's something that we personally are working on at Bigelow, I think, because they're all dog lovers and, and developing um, basically home tests so that people that live on these bodies of water can just test to see if there's microcystin toxins out there. Now, the fourth thing is ocean warming leads to sea level rise and coastal flooding. And this is the big, this is the big issue um, of these five for, um, for Charleston. Now, ocean warming leads to an increase in sea level rise uh, in one hand for basic physics. If you warm up a fluid, it takes up more room. Right, So if nothing else was changing, you simply increase the temperature of the water, that water is going to take up a larger um, amount of space, so a larger volume. So about a third of sea level rise that we have measured to date can be explained purely by thermal expansion. Then roughly about a third is from the melting of sea ice, either glaciers or um, glaciers or um, ice sheets in Antarctica, land-based ice sheets flowing in the water. And then about a third are very localized and they have to do with subsidence of that can be caused by a number of different things. So if you Google and you try to learn about flooding in, um, uh, in Charleston, you probably don't have to because you've all experienced it. Um, but it's a very low-lying um, locale on the coast. And so there's lots of um, lots of examples of where this has been a problem. This is from a paper written in 2020 on the past, present, and future nuisance floodings in um, the Charleston Peninsula. So this is looking at flood events starting around 1920. These red dots are observed events. The blue dots were calculated by various means from evidence, and the black is forecasted. So. These events are becoming more common and they're forecasted to become much more common. Now, one of the, when you, so I said that there are things that are pretty much a consensus of what scientists believe and where you start getting controversy or more unknowns is when you try to extrapolate these large physical um, uh, principles to more localized. And so, um, and you do that through modeling. Right? You can't take every measurement you want everywhere, so you, you model. And there's a great uh, tool from NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, that um, is a tool that you can use to look at the flooding risk in your area. And it's it, it, it can be really valuable to, one, drive home the point that this the, of the, the peril you might be in, um, but it can also be a useful tool in terms of looking at to making priorities of what you want to address first as a community. So if you go in to the coastal flood exposure mapper and you put the, this is the whole United States, you know, the hot spot is Louisiana down here. Um, but there's another hot spot up in Raleigh. And if you go even closer, so I type in the address of this club. And so it can get you to the street view. So it's really powerful. Now they are constantly refining this, but it looked, seemed pretty accurate on the places that I had actual knowledge of. Um, uh, and so, if, 
let's see, where should I go with this? Um, so the the redder it gets, the the higher in the hazard zone, the more likelihood you will experience flooding and the severity of the flooding. So there is a lot going on all around here. Now, even if you don't live in one of these areas, which I get that a lot if I go inland and I give these kind of talks, Flooding will still impact you. So this was a December 21 Forbes article that um, looking at 733,000 um, data points evaluating and est estimating what floods would cost in 2022, so our past year, the estimate was it would cost U.S. businesses $49 billion last year. I was not able to find what the actual estimates are. I'm sure that what it did cost because they're not out yet. So think about $49 billion. So this is impacting our economy and this is just businesses, okay? So this is not this is not a total estimate of, of flood damage. Just to put it in context, you know, I talked about NSF, which is really the underpinning of our technology um, sector in the United States and science sector. The budget last year was 8.8 .8 billion, right? So yes, we are a wealthy country. Yes, we have lots of money in various sectors, but 49 billion, that's a lot of money compared to what we are investing in trying to solve some of these problems. And you can't talk about flooding without talking about hurricanes when you're in a place like uh, South Carolina. This is a shot from the 1989 Hugo. And this is an area of... Um, this is an area where the, the data is continually being updated. And so some of the things I'm gonna tell you is different than I said when I gave my testimony, if any of you ever, I'm sure you all watched it, at least if you knew my dad, you did. Um, so climate change has resulted in the following things. One is stronger winds, stronger hurricanes. Hurricanes get their power from the, the warmth of the water. So the warmer the water, the more potential energy to fuel them. And, and, and when I gave my testimony, we could not say that yet. They were not, that was not statistically significant, but we have at this point, there's enough data that is showing that trend. They seem to, there's more rapid intensification of the hurricanes. I mean, there's been a number of big ones recently that, you know, you go to bed and it's a two. My sister lives in New Orleans, so I really watch the golf a lot. You know, I go to bed and it's two o'clock and I get up in the morning and it's, it's a category four and it's changed direction. So they are intensifying at a rate that is much greater than in the past. And there's more extreme rainfall, right? So the, the, the water is warmer, and so there's more evaporation. And because there's more evaporation, there's more moisture in the air to begin with. And the fifth thing related to climate is not related to warming, but it's related to the CO2 in the atmosphere. Because that CO2 in the atmosphere, if it increases, it's going to want to become an equilibrium with the surface ocean, dissolved in the surface ocean. And when CO2 combines with water, um, it forms carbonic acid, and that is what causes ocean acidification. And in a place like um, South Carolina that loves its seafood, anything that creates a shell in the ocean, whether it's corals or all of the yummy things we love to eat, if it's the water is acidified, it's that organism is having to work a little bit harder in order to make that shell and maintain that shell because the water around it is, is working chemically against it. This is also a big financial deal. So the fishing sector in the United States, and this is pre-pandemic, was $200 billion and it provided 1.6 million jobs. So this, you know, I think about this a lot in being in Maine, but this really is a, a national issue, incredibly lucrative industry and ocean acidification affects a lot of these fisheries. Okay, so what is Bigelow doing about it? And I, I need to go faster. Um, so the, the first part of our mission statement is we study the foundations of global ocean health. And that means we work on the microbes. We work on the little guys, uh, phytoplankton, bacteria, viruses, because they're the foundation of the ocean food webs. And then we go one level up and we study the things that eat them. We also study corals and kelp because they are the foundational species where they exist. And could give uh, lots of talks about the various basic research that we do. Um, one big project that a number of our scientists were involved in was the two-year um, Arctic project, International Arctic Project, 
um, Steve Archer is here in the, his blue cap, and he's looking at gas exchange through ice and water for these various trace gases in the ocean. And all the way down to something like uh, microplastics. We develop techniques to quickly monitor and count and, and characterize microplastics. And then the impact those mi microplastics can have on the environment. The second part of our mission statement is then we use our discoveries to improve the future for all life on our planet. And we do that primarily in two ways. One is through what we say call inspiration. It's the education programs. It's the uh, art collaborations. It's the workforce development programs. And it's the outreach, right? It's the kind of thing I'm doing right now. It's trying to tell people about the science, what we're finding, um, hopefully to get them involved and, and interested. And the other way we do this is through our solution-based research. And a couple of examples of that is one, the Tandy Center for Ocean Forecasting. The United States invests enormous amounts of money monitoring. We monitor a lot in terms of different variables out in the marine environment. What we are not particularly good at is quickly collecting all that data and these various data streams and turning it into a product that is in a time frame for somebody to use it. And I'll give you an example. Farmers, if you're a farmer, you pay attention to the weather forecast, right? Ideally, we want to get to the point that we are monitoring the important variables in terms of, of temperature, acidity, nutrient concentration, harmful algal bloom concentrations, so that if you're a farmer in the ocean, you can get up in the same way you have your cup of coffee and you are looking at the ocean forecast. Are those harmful um, concentrations of harmful algae increasing? Do you want to pull your product a week early? Are those concentrations going back down? Let's leave it in the water and let's make it more valuable. That The trick is getting it quick enough. Um, and I, one of the guys you saw in the video, Nick Record, I think is really making progress in terms of advising and predicting precisely when these blooms happen. Because if you close down areas because you think a bloom might happen and it doesn't, you've just really hit somebody's livelihood. So I think there's enormous potential in the kind of forecasting work that we're doing. We also try to support the aquaculture industry. One example of that is um, salmon farming. Um, and, and the aquaculture industry, I want to give a big plug for that. You know, if we are going to feed 10 billion people by 2050, which is one of the estimates, we have got to get really good at creating protein. And we're not going to get it from the ocean anymore. We have fished down the food chain to the extent that it's just not going to be able to do it. So we have to be able to sustainably, environmentally sustainably create a lot of protein. One example of that is salmon. So the the and a big in terms of the the market of salmon wild salmon is this beautiful red color the redder it is the more valuable it is on the market that redness comes from astaxanthin it's a pigment same pigment that makes uh, flamingos pink and it's produced by a phytoplankton farm salmon is gray unless in the feed you add as, uh, synthetic astaxanthin is mostly what's added. It's a petroleum derivative, not the best thing if you want made in Maine seafood. So we're trying to trying to tweak nature by understanding the conditions that make it go from green and happy to red loaded with astaxanthin to get it closer to the price point that we can actually put phytoplankton into the feed, which is what the fish meets anyway, instead of um, a synthetic derivative of astaxanthin. We also have a project called Burp Busters, um, which we have now started calling cow, wait, coast to cow to consumer. Um, and this is all about cows, which I never thought I would study as an oceanographer. So cows have multiple stomachs and in the, in the guts of cows, they have methane producing microbes. And they, when they're chewing their cud, about 90% of the emissions of methane is they're burping it back out. It's uncomfortable for the cow. It's an incredible source of methane. So every day per cow produces three tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in terms of methane. If you're a farmer, it's a, it's a, it's a complete waste, right? Because about 10% of the food you are feeding that cow is coming out at methane. And remember methane was 25 times more potent than CO2 in terms of, of warming potential. So using algae, it turns out if you if you eat it kelp, they stop producing methane. So now trying to take that basic finding 
and engineer to get it into a feed supplement at a price point that farmers can pay for is, and we're getting close. I, we first started this, I thought this was pie in the sky. I'm gonna tell you right now, we are gonna change the concentration of methane in the atmosphere and I'm gonna wear it on a shirt and give it to everyone. Um, and then there's uh, there's a broad um, area, which I'm not gonna be able to go into is car ocean carbon dioxide removal. And there's lots of different ways that scientists have thought about we, ways we could suck carbon dioxide into the ocean, basically by enhancing natural processes. The, one of the transects, um, I don't think it's the one you have on the table, the whole transect really focused on this. And it could be things like seaweed farming, ocean fertilization, ocean alkalization, which is basically you know, putting the equivalent of Tums into the ocean to try to counteract the acidity, um, artificial upwelling and ecological restoration. The one thing that I think is is troubling, actually, I'll get to that in a minute. I did want to do a call out on your climate action plan that um, was written. I just asked the mayor about it. There he is. Um, thrilled to see that you guys have one. I learned you were one of the first communities. I looked through it. I am not an expert on climate mitigation, but it looked robust and um, and you've already made a lot of progress on it. and. In this case, one of the things you, the plan talks about is the importance of sequestering carbon in marshes. I mean, marshes, you know, 100 years ago were were gross areas that you wanted to fill in so that bad air didn't come out of it. But they are incredible sinks of carbon. And so we need to stop destroying them, start reinforcing them, and start helping them grow. And this was one example of that. Okay, so what can you do about climate change? The first thing I think we all need to realize is that science alone isn't enough. I think a lot of a lot of people have a view that science is just going to get us out of it. And I think the carbon dioxide removal research that we're doing, the more we get into it, the more we are bumping up against pure physical limitations in terms of the magnitude of what we can accomplish with that. Even with waving our arms with lots of probably unrealistic assumptions, we can still not draw enough carbon down to make a real dent to the magnitude of what we hoped we could do a decade ago. So there are limits to science. If we wanted science to solve this problem, we should have started 40 years ago. And that was a very sobering thought um, when I started coming to that realization. We all need to reduce our carbon footprint as individuals. And there are, if you go online and you Google reducing your carbon footprint, you will find hundreds of websites. Pick and choose the things you can easily incorporate in your life. There are so many things you can do that, you, that could have an impact um, that really are not onerous to any of us. And yet the reality is individuals acting alone aren't enough. I'm gonna use waste as an example. Many of you, I hope, are are like me. You're you recycle, you compost, you you know. I I I try not to buy new things unless I really need it. I'll buy used if I can. All these things to try to reduce the waste that I'm producing. But for every ton of residential waste, industry produces seventy. So even if everything, if everybody in this room and everybody in the country does the, a fabulous job. Still, we are 171st of the problem. Now, ideally, ideally, we would create a culture and industry that they would make the changes and do the right thing. The problem is we don't have time for that culture switch because it definitely doesn't exist today. We, which means we have got to legislate, we have got to create rules and guidelines, we have got to force the situation because we are really out of time. And that's what I think is so thrilling about a community like Charleston that really put, took the time to put together a robust plan because so few communities do this. I'm really happy to say a lot of communities in Maine are doing it. Um, and it's shockingly hard when you really think about how you can manage these various things. On the other hand, if you wanna be really inspired, Jared, I watched your TEDx talk and I was like, yes. So. What is amazing about his talk is he had so many great examples of, yes, these are, we, we're going to have to have difficult changes and, and trade-offs, 
but it can also be done in a way that actually enhances our community. So really bravo to the mayor and the town. And one of the things you can do is to support these kinds of things, get involved because the rubber meets the road in the local areas. And if you are lucky enough to live in a community to have a plan, support that plan and make it happen. But at the end of the day, for a problem that is as big as climate change, we need programs that are just as big. And the United States is good at that, right? If you think about the amazing things we've done in the past, we put a man on the moon, we won World War II when we were not at all scientifically or socially prepared to enter it, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act. If we are motivated, this country can do amazing things. And we have got to mobilize on that scale. But if we're going to do it, we got to start talking to each other. So I'm sure there are people of both political parties in this room. And if I could make one request, it would be everybody vote. Only don't just vote. Be active in the process. Ask your candidate, what is your climate change plan? Do they, they should know, they should have a plan about that, like they have a plan about health care, sorry, or a right? I'm losing my train of thought here. We need, we need informed leadership in this country. And we need those leaders, both sides of the, of the aisle to talk to each other because otherwise we're not going to get it done. And with that, I'll say thank you so much for your time. And um, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Braun. Um, I know some some have to run off the reservations, but we definitely open it up for some Q and A. Um, so wait till I get to you on the mic. Just raise your hand. Got a first question here. Thank you. Seems to me that uh, we, we should make note that the United States of America has produced uh, emissions, greenhouse emissions, which I, I don't believe. I don't think you mentioned that, but back to the 1980s level, and uh, we lead the world in reducing that. And I think that's worth noting. Thank you. I'm not sure I wholly, uh, we have made progress. Oh, no, no, not progress. We led the world reducing greenhouse emissions. Thank you. Next question. Do you think the, there will be a, an effect with all the windmills that are being uh, produced? Well, they say that they're going to start on the whole East Coast and come down. Will that affect the marine? Yeah, so offshore wind is a tough one. Um, in the studies I've looked at, I don't see how we get off fossil fuels without offshore wind. If you look on the East Coast, if you get farther out, farther out um, off the shelf, we have category five winds off the East Coast. That is, those are incredibly powerful winds that are also consistent winds. So one of the, and, and Bigelow actually is involved in this because I signed an uh, easement agreement with an organization, um, New England Aquaventus, to land the, the termination cable of a research turbine, which would be the first uh, turbine in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and the problem is if you put something in the ocean, you're gonna hurt the ocean, right? Whether it's a lobster trap, whether it's a boat, whether it's a, a turbine. So the idea that I'm supporting putting something in the ocean, that was a hard decision, but it pales in comparison to the continued release of greenhouse gases. So we need to do it responsibly, but we need, I believe, and this is, I I'm probably should take my hat off as Bigelow CEO, although Bigelow is supporting an offshore wind research project, and I'll put my hat on as Debbie Bronx citizen. I support offshore wind. I don't see how we get off fully off greenhouse gas, uh, fully off fossil fuels without offshore wind. Um, we could do it with more nuclear, but the time frame of getting nuclear that comes with its whole other ball of wax. 
but the time frame for actually getting nuclear implemented is so long in this country because of legal disputes. So I think offshore wind is is necessary. Any more questions? Yeah, hey, thank you for being here tonight. Tonight, um, frankly, I'm on a little bit different camp on some of these issues. Trying to get on board with some. Some are challenging for me, I'll be honest. I was trying to do some research just offhand on especially the niche map. Are you familiar with the one that I'm mentioning? Areas of the world that seem like they'll be less habitable. Oh, the red. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Did I see that that came out of another country? It looked like maybe the lead author was from a different country. Could you maybe share if China is leading the world? In some of the research, or if the U.S. is leading the world, personally, I'm having trouble. It seems so like it's from a different country. No, so the sources, the sources of the data that this was used was the IPCC, and it was written by the Economist. So the weird thing about the Economist is they they don't have authors; they have groups of authors. Like I don't know how many of you read the economist um but no this was not put out from china and it came from the ipcc um that does lead the world right now though in greenhouse gas emissions they are the largest source and, of and greenhouse emissions gas emissions giving into the atmosphere yes I've, I've read that as well yeah maybe follow up how are they doing <laughs> so the thing about china is um they're not a democracy Right. So they can turn on a dime if somebody says they want to do something. So. Um, and you also never really know how much of the story you're getting. So there are some areas in China um, in industrial regions in China that are still going, you know, built a coal fired power plant In other areas. They're doing experimental cities with like the state of the art green technology because they can just say it so and they don't care who lives on the land at the time. And so in a way they have a bit of an advantage um, because they don't involve their citizens in the decisions that they're making. So on one hand, it's frustrating because I wish more of the data from these experiments that they're doing was being released. All you hear about is the things that work, right? You're not gonna hear about the things that don't. Um, and it's tough to really tell the whole story, because so much of what you are told is what they want you to know. Um, but they they are investing in some parts of the country in really state of the art green technology um, at a rate that I don't think we're keeping up with, which is very scary. Um, we got time for one more. Mr. Mayor. Thank you for being with us and thanks for the shout out for our climate action plan. And by the way, on the back page of it, we have this one page where you, you can check off uh, everyday things that we can do to help reduce our carbon footprint. It's on our website, but we can send it out. But my question, I found this very interesting, the impact of climate change on ocean currents that someone told me, for example, that the Gulf Stream pulls water um, away from the east coast of the United States. And for example, if the um, if the Gulf Stream were to slow down, um, it would end up uh, aggravating sea level rise just because of the change in the ocean current. Yeah, so, um, okay, so we, how far back to go? So we live on a sphere, right? The planet is round. We get excess energy that comes in at the equator. But because energy can't just build up in a space, in a place, the way the planet, the physics of the planet works is the current all basically pulling that energy towards the poles. Okay, so in the case of air currents, they are moving through Hadley cells towards the poles, and it is the friction of the air currents against the surface of the ocean that is pushing the surface ocean currents. Okay, now if you are increasing the energy that the planet has to deal with, you're going to change currents. 
The question is, how do you change currents? In one hand, the simplest answer would probably be, well, there's more energy to distribute, everything's beat up. But it's not that simple in terms of the Gulf Stream. North Atlantic is where deep ocean water forms. So that's the hole below the, the surface of the ocean that's moved by the winds. All of the deep ocean movement is through temperature and salinity changes, through density changes. And in the North Atlantic, there's a lot of rivers that come in the North Atlantic off of Canada, adding fresh water. Fresh water is light, um, but it, uh, uh, back up, 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 back up. You've got seawater and you're freezing the seawater. Now, when you freeze seawater, it forms this clathrate structure and it exudes the salts. So I don't know if you've ever heard that saying, like the Arctic explorers, if you get multi-year ice, you can melt that and drink it. There's it, Even though it was formed with seawater, there's no ice left in it. Because every time that ice freezes and remelt, uh, uh, melts and then refreezes, it's excluding more salt. So right under that, where that ice is forming, that water is very cold, which makes it denser, and it's very um, salty, which makes it denser, and it sinks. And so that is the source that starts this whole conveyor belt of ocean circulation. And it is that formation that is drawing, helps to draw the Gulf Stream up because there's basically a sink that doesn't impede the flow. That process isn't happening as fast as it, right? Because there's not as much ice and it's not as cold. So have you ever seen the, the movie, um, The Day After Tomorrow? It's not a great movie, but it did have Dennis Quaid. So I watched it a few times when I was younger. So one of the tip-offs for that whole thing was that the, the currents in the North Atlantic were shutting down. And scary, now the day after tomorrow is not happening, but there is evidence that the currents in the North Atlantic are slowing down. That meridional, they call it the meridional overturning circulation is slowing down. And it's because of what's happening in the North Atlantic in terms of there's less ice formation um, and it's warmer. So not as much deep water is forming. And that, and now you're getting in, there was a great New York Times article about this uh, maybe a year ago, um, but the Gulf, so, so right. And if the Gulf Stream weakens, it can wobble more the, the warming in the Gulf of Maine right now is, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than just about any other spot in the world. And part of it is because the weakening Arctic currents, the Labrador current that used to bring very cold water in, and it would keep the Gulf Stream out. Well, now the Gulf, more of that Gulf Stream water is is coming in. So did I, I'm sure if I, yeah. you just got my first lecture in, in uh, ocean circulation for my, but the, the currents are, the changing those currents around, um, it, it, yeah, it's not simple. And there's a lot, you wanna talk about our thing, people that don't disagree on some of the finer details, the science meetings, when you get the physical oceanographers talking, they're not as nice as biologists. But you are right, that wobbly, there is, there is evidence that some of that is happening. And the, the, real, the real peril of that is the Gulf Stream right now is what comes around and delivers so much of the warmth that makes Europe warm. So if you slow that down, well, if you slow that, if that really stops, we're really, just forget it. Just, just have a big party because it's, um, but, it, but there is evidence that it is slowing down. Well, I'm getting glib, so I probably should stop talking now. <laughs> Dr. Bronk, uh, on behalf of everyone in this room, I'd uh, like to thank you once again for making the trip all the way down from Maine uh, to be here with us this evening. Um, and on behalf of the Rotary Club, we got a little bag of Charleston goodies here for you. Um, and let's give Dr. Bronk one more round of applause. And thank you all for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. We'll see you in April.